Our text today is the reading from the gospel. And Jesus said unto him, Go home to your friends. Tell them what great things God has done for thee and had compassion on thee. You would be hard pressed to find the strangest story anywhere in the whole Bible. So wild and weird it was in any way. But years later, the disciples could still vividly recall the details. Their nerves were already on edge that night when their little fishing boat touched ground on the far coastline of Gadara. In the pale light of the moon, they could see the hillside looming before them, burrowed with caves in which the Gadarenes buried their dead. And then the midnight silence was shattered by a blood-curdling scream, a voice shrieking curses upon them and threats of destruction. And then they saw it, him, the figure of a man leaping down toward them, naked, untamed, his body marked by scars and fresh wounds. Not a maniac, but a demoniac. A man possessed with devils. What happened next is easier to describe than it is to explain. Jesus stood his ground. Come out of him, thou unclean spirit. And the wild figure rushed at Jesus, fell down at his feet, and said, What do you want with me? Jesus, thou son of the most high God, have you come to torment me before the time? What is your name? My name is Legion, for we are many. And the voice, or the voices, begged Jesus to send them into the pigs, for higher on the slope, a herd of swine was peacefully grazing. And Jesus gave them permission to release their vice-like grip on the victim and to enter into the pigs. But other eyes were watching and ears were listening. The swine herds up on the hill saw the boat full of strangers land on the shore. The angry confrontation between the strangers and legion. And then they saw something they never thought they'd see, something they didn't want to see. The herd snorted and panicked and stampeded headlong down the steep hill, over the cliff, two thousand of them in number, onto the rocks and into the waters below. How were they going to explain this? Losing the entire herd, which they were paid to take care of. They beat it out of there at once, back to town to tell their version of this story. By morning, the entire countryside was alerted. The gatherings came out in large numbers. And they saw the former demoniac, not naked, clothed, not raving, but sitting quietly at Jesus' feet, not shrinking in torment, but in his right mind. See, the swine herds were saying, see the guy we call Legion? He ain't what he once was. And look at this. And pointed him over the edge of the cliff to the sorry sight down below. The floating, bloating bodies of 2,000 pigs Washing up on shore. They were afraid, the text of, afraid of what? Well, they weren't supposed to be raising pigs in the first place. If you know anything at all about Jewish culture, you know that pigs 
We're not kosher. They're unclean. Strictly forbidden by the ceremonial law. And they knew that. And there stood a stranger who had done what they could not do. They had tried to subdue the turmoil of this wild man with external measure. And Jesus set free the man's spirit, delivered his body from the vile service to Satan, cleansed the house of his life from the filth, brought harmony back to his conflicted personality, and brought him again out of the habitat of the dead into the land of the living. I would have thought, wouldn't you? The day the one time got everybody who was sick or tormented. Go get grandma with a crippling arthritis. Hey, bring the neighbor kid whose feet are deformed. Uncle Charlie with his drinking problem. No. They say to Jesus, please leave. Go back to the boat, back to Capernaum, back to wherever you want to, but get out and stay out. They saw Jesus as a menace to business as usual, a threat to their economic policies, a disturber of their peace, and an embarrassment to the Chamber of Commerce. Isn't this a great line, folks? They saw the man in his right mind, and they were afraid. They were more scared of sanity than they were insanity. They saw a guy in his right mind at Jesus' feet, one man who didn't follow the herd instinct anymore, didn't go along with the crowd, didn't do what everybody else is doing, say and think what everybody else is saying and thinking. And so, they told Jesus to leave. I, I mean, you're going to put people more important than property. I mean, the soul of a single human being means more than pigs. Get out. And Jesus did. He never returned again to the region of Gadara. But wait, there's one more scene down on the beach as a boarding ship for the return voyage. And it's a moving scene in this drama. The former demoniac wants to go along with Jesus, wants to become his disciple. Stay at the side of the man to whom he owes his life. You can understand his motives, can't you? The debt of gratitude welling up within his heart. To get away from the scene of his shameful past. The notoriety and the reputation which people never let you forget. And the lure of a fresh start. A new life, a new surrounding. Ah, oh, come on, let me go along. And Jesus, who grants the request of the devils to go on the swine, who grants the request of the gatherings to leave, Jesus denies the request of his most loyal follower. What do you make of that? <laughs> Jesus says, go home. Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and have compassion on you. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, you, you serve me by going home. Go back to the people that know everything there is to know about you, even the worst, the authorities who put the cuffs and the leg irons on you, to the farmers who stick their dogs on you, to the mothers who frighten 
their children with the boogeyman, you, when they were naughty. To the teenagers who came on on a Saturday night to see you drinking among the gravestones. Go back home. You are not what you once were. You are changed. Cleaner. Freer. Saner. And they will notice. They will inquire how you've got the scars on your wrist and on your ankle. And then you tell them, please, don't preach to them, lecture them, argue with them, jam religion down their throats. Just tell them what great thing the Lord has done for you. Uh, they'll be more interested in devil possession than in divine deliverance. They want you to hit the lecture circuit and tell everybody, I was a teenage werewolf, but look at me. Don't you dare do that. Don't tell about you at all. Don't put yourself in this play with them. You go home. The hardest place in the world to go. Because if you're not believable at home, where you live, where they all know you, they won't believe you anywhere else anyway. Go home. Isn't that a wonderful thing for Mother Teresa, well known for her hospice work in India, running this little establishment where the outcasts from the streets of Calcutta can come and die. On a tour of New York, a young medical student was so impressed, she volunteered to go at once to India. No, Mother Teresa said, Find your own Calcutta. Calcutta's around you. Your home, your neighborhood, the larger circle of your friends. And when the old nun fell ill at the end of the line, she didn't hop a plane and come to some medical center in America. She stayed among the people with whom she served she died where she had lived. You, you go to work, and then you go home. You come to church, and then go home. You shop, you visit, you vacation, you go home. Please. People. In that narrow, narrow sphere of activity, you are doing your Lord's bidding. You are doing for Him the most important thing in the world. Don't you see? You are giving to your God, to your church, to your country, what all the grandiose government programs and all the social agencies and multiplied millions in money cannot manufacture one home. The nursery of your infant years. The haven for the wanderer. The resting place for the weary laborer. The hospital for the broken heart. A home where God does the most extraordinary thing in the lives of the most ordinary people for whom his mercy is as fresh as the morning dew, whose lives are lived out in Jesus' hand and left there absolutely. Go home. Tell them what great things God has done for you. I, I know it's the hardest place in the world to go. 
But don't let people sidetrack you or make you feel that they're someplace else, someplace different, someplace better, more exotic, grander opportunities, wider vistas. Hey, anybody can get up in this pulpit and preach a sermon. Hard place to go back home across the street and try to live it with a wife and children and neighbors. And the results always seem so small. And the setback <laughs> so bitterly disappointing. But all spiritual progress is slow. I know. I've been at it for a long, long time. Two steps forward. One step back. One step forward. Oh, two steps back. But the growth will come if you are patient with Christ as he is patient with you. And so, the man is left there standing on the shore alone, as it were, in a hostile land, watching that little ship sail over the horizon and out of sight. <laughs> Not much to show, is it, for all of the trouble of a voyage back and forth across the sea. One man. But Christ is absolutely confident and certain of that one man. You see, Jesus came from farther than the other side of the sea. Jesus came from the other side of the sky to do great things for you and me. And for the moment, he's left us behind to tell of his mercy in an unmerciful world. Amen. The peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.